Welcome to Spirits Podcast, episode 59, Lak Lung Kwan and Ao Ko. That was a good... How did uh, I do? That was pretty good. Not bad? I liked it. Uh, I am really, really stoked for these Vietnamese myths. We had an amazing time recording it. We also, um, I don't know, just like, I keep thinking about them. Yeah. They're such good characters. At, when we finished recording, Amanda turned to me, she's like, that was a really good, like, start of the new year episode. I'm like, I, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, Because that's really what I was going for. Do you know who deserve really good New Year's? Um, probably our patrons. Our newest patrons, Julia. Not you. Julia Rose, though, is I know. Name. I was just like, like, I was, I was like, like, did Julia did pledge to our Patreon? to our Patreon? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> Other Julia Rose, imposter Julia Rose. Uh, Terry, Fonda, Sigita, Stephanie, Talia, Abby, Iron, Molly, and Jillian. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Happy New Year to all y'all. Thanks for playing with us in this space. Yeah. And thanks also to our supporting producer level patrons, Neil, Chandra, Philip, Julie, Sarah, Christina, Josh, Eeyore, Ryan, Shelby, Lynn, Mercedes, Sandra, Robert, Lindsay, Phil, Catherine, and Deborah. Uh, we wish you have a hundred wonderful children, if that's what you want in life. And if not, then you don't, I, and you're happy with it, and no one ever asks you invasive questions about if you're going to have children. Yeah. And thanks as well to our legend level patrons whose new box for the new month is going to go out in just about a week. Leanne, Erin, Ashley, Shannon, Cammie, Cassie, and Ashley Marie. Hello and welcome all of you to the new year and to your awesome legendary year. Nice. <laughs> And while we're on the topic of Patreon, we did just want to give you guys a quick note that we are now going to be measuring our goals on Patreon in number of patrons. It's important to us that the community comes first and not necessarily money. Like the money we make supports things that we want to do for the audience, not the other way around. Um, So we thought this was a good way to really just emphasize that to us and to everybody else. Yep. Uh, And we have some exciting stuff planned that we're still working out for our next couple of Patreon goals. Uh, And I think it's going to be stuff that y'all will like. The closest one is our visit to Akron, Ohio, to the Spaghetti Warehouse, hopefully. I can't can't believe we're going to do that. This podcast is amazing. But on that topic, though, we really want you guys to send us voicemails if you have been to Spaghetti Warehouse or if someone you know has been to Spaghetti Warehouse. Like, tell us just whatever your impressions were. Tell us how the food was. If especially there was a haunting type situation, we really want to hear it. Use a voice memo on your phone and email spiritspodcast at gmail.com. Yes, we want your apocryphal or true life spaghetti warehouse stories. I know I know a lot of you have them. Please tell them to us. And we want them pretty soon, like in the next week if you can. So when you listen to this episode, if it's before like mid-January, before sort of the end-ish of January, please email them to us. And frankly, even if it's afterward, if you're listening to this in the far future and Julianne and me are dead or not podcasting anymore, Julie gave me a weird look right there. I'm just saying it's going to be out there. The internet's forever. Uh, email us your spending warehouse emails. We really want to hear them. Yeah, we want to hear your voices too. So yes, send them with the voicemails. That would that's, be great. That's true for every urban legend, by the way. If you want to send us your hometown urban legend, or especially have your grandparents talk about hauntings, oh, we yes. want to hear it. That, 100%. We want to hear it. Spirits Podcast at Gmail. Jules, what were we drinking this episode? Uh, we were drinking some champagne, Amanda, because I have weddings on the brain. Yep. <laughs> um, and so it seemed like a very romantic drink to go with this somewhat romantic story, I guess. And I was drinking it the way that I think it was Tom Hanks or somebody who talked about uh, learning to drink champagne just in a big cup filled with ice. That's how you drink champagne. Same. That way it doesn't get so sugary, you know, and like it kind of makes and it kind of lasts the day. I'm all about that. Thank you, Tom Hanks. Probably not Tom Hanks. Probably Bill Murray or something like that. You know, it might have been Bill Murray. Probably. I get those two mixed up. Anyway, finally, thank you to our sponsor this week, RX Bar, uh, which apparently is so famous that Julia's dad got Julia's mom a bar of it for Christmas. Okay. (laughs) To explain, my parents and my family and I, every Christmas, we exchange Trader Joe's gifts. Ooh, I like that tradition. Two gifts per person. Yeah. And you'd like, you know, everyone hands that person two gifts that they got for them specifically they thought of them at trader joe's and my dad being the health nut that he is got my mother uh these sweet sweet rx bars they are sweet but naturally sweet because they are i I meant sweet like they're awesome i was making a pun there my dude okay they're made up of real ingredients we'll tell them about you later but for now you can go to rxbar.com slash spirits and enter promo code spirits at checkout for 25 percent off your first order that's a super good deal it is a super good deal. We are really, really grateful. Thanks again to RX Bar. And without further ado, enjoy Spirits Podcast Episode 59, Lak Lung Kwan and Ao Ko. So Amanda, 
We don't often dive into actual history on the podcast. Uh, we tend to stay more in the realm of the fantastical and folklorish, right? We do. We do. Sometimes it, it you know, tangentially kind of brushes against um, actual history, but most of the time we're like, huh, lol, I don't know what this was, but it's fun. You know, every now and again, there is a story that has some amazing mythology in it, but it's also rooted in history. Uh, like, for example, we talked briefly about the Mojaji or the Rain Queens in South Africa. Yeah, you we remember did. that episode. Um and I thought, hey, it's it's been a while since we kind of touched on a topic like that. Um, so I wanted to dig into something that is both fantastic and fantastical and historical. I love it. I love it. Uh, so we are going to take a trip to Vietnam, Ooh. Uh, specifically around the year 2793 BCE. Oh my goodness, that is a very long time ago. Yes, it is. Wow. But we got some historical records from there, Amanda. I want to know and all about it. Cool folklore. Ooh. This is the story of Lac Long Quan, uh, which literally translates to the Dragon Lord of Lac. Um, I'm in. Um, I am going to say straight up right now, I am sorry if I mispronounce anything. I did try my best and did a lot of research and listened to a bunch of uh, small Vietnamese children tell this myth to me about 10 different times uh, via YouTube videos. Uh, but if I mispronounce stuff, I am very sorry. We're going to get into the myth, but first I kind of want to talk about what we know of Lac Long Quang from a historical perspective. Let's do it. So Quan was the second Hung King of the Hong Bang dynasty, uh, which took place in ancient Vietnam. Okay. Um, they were in power during the height of what we now know as the Bronze Age, and they flourished because of their location along the water rice civilization in the Red River Delta. Uh, that sounds Red River Delta like a fertile place somewhere you really want to be. Yeah, and where you can grow rice easily, and then, you know, your society does well because rice is feeds the masses. It's it very does. Important. And, uh, and prosperity is power. Yes, absolutely. So the tribes of what would become Vietnam were originally unified by a man called Lok Tok, uh, who consolidated the other tribes and succeeded in grouping all of the vassal states within his territory into a unified nation, which was about 100 years before Quan's reign. Wow. Lok Tuk is regarded as the ancestor to all the Hung kings, uh, as well as the founding father of Vietnam and a Vietnamese cultural hero who taught his people how to cultivate rice. That is seriously a heroic deed. You I know. know. Like, I get why that would be your founding father. I mean, so from a historical perspective, a lot of times when we talk about how civilizations are founded, it always starts with agriculture. Absolutely. So to have someone historically provide the grain that becomes, you know, the lifeblood of the people, so to speak. Yeah. It's a very, very important thing. And of course, he's going to be held to a high standard in folklore as well. I'm so stoked to see where the folkloric aspect comes in. Um, well, that's good because literally that's basically all we know about them <laughs> from a historical perspective. Dope, rice, uh, goodbye. Rivers. Rivers, cool. bye. Uh, these were the people, but we don't know anything about them. Okay. Um, so... The rest, the folklore aspect, uh, begins to kind of form as time goes on. Uh, for example, uh, Lac Long Quan was said to have been the descendant of dragons, hence the, the dragon lord of Lac. Um, Love it. Uh, and in most stories, he has some sort of superhuman strength, which comes from his dragon heritage. Wow. And I mean, like, his, his actual feat of either, you know, teaching or making possible, you know, facilitating or or whatever, just like giving the conditions for rice um, cultivation to flourish, that is superhuman, right? Like that is so punching above the weight of normal, like farm better there, mm -hmm. you know, like like it, it, I'm sure just completely changed the path um, of Vietnamese history. Yeah. And so that was his grandfather, but because they're the same descendants from the that dragon lineage, line. Exactly. Yeah, the dra that dragon lineage is really like helping him do kind of incredible stuff. Dragon runs strong in his veins. Yes. Uh, so here's a good story of like incredible feats that he did. Please. Uh, during Quan's time as a leader, the land was still underdeveloped and isolated. So we're still in the process of the uh, civilization beginning to flourish. So like uh, tribes and like discrete places, or it was kind of one unified empire, but just kind of like disparate. Unified empire, but think like early Rome. So we're okay. thinking of like slowly starting to build and expand, yeah. uh, but we're not at that level of prosperity at the height of the 
power of the group. Yeah, uh, travel is harder. Communication is harder. Exactly. You know, definitely the the average world that a person experiences was much, much smaller. Yeah. And I mean, we're talking about 2793 BCE. That's when uh, Lac Long Quang was said to have started his reign. That is so much for my mind to wrap itself around It's It's crazy. years ago. I know. It's crazy thinking about just like how far we've come as human beings, but also I like know. how we were telling stories 5,000 years ago. That's insane. Yeah. And like making pots and knives and armor, which yeah. we still do. Like, yeah. It's oh, it's crazy. Okay. Um, so in the Eastern Sea, uh, there appeared a giant fish, which was known as Notin, uh, or as it translates directly from Vietnamese, the fish monster. Okay. I mean, they're very straightforward names in this. Um, I'm sure a lot is lost in translation, but like a giant thing in the sea, that's a fish monster, my dude. Of course. This fish had supposedly been around for centuries, living much longer than any fish should, obviously, uh, and had a mouth so large that it could consume a ship with 10 fishermen in one gulp. Wow. I mean, like doable, knowing what you know about whales, you know, and Mm -hmm. kind of other big creatures from the deep. But that is terrifying. So whenever the fish would swim near the coast, waves would reach the sky and (sighs) would drown multiple ships and all people passing through the area were eaten by the fish. Wow. Which like, you got to wonder who escaped to tell that story. Yeah. Because gosh, that sounds like tsunamis. That sounds like, you know. Other Animals. freak occurrences, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Or even a slaughter if there was a kind of human-created event that no one took credit for. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I can just imagine somebody from a neighboring town like taking their weekly walk you know, over to trade with someone or confer with someone and being like, oh my God, oh, you know, everyone's what, gone. what hath nature wrought, truly? Really. Yeah, no. Um, so the fish monster was said to live in a big cave under the sea. So naturally, as a leader... A giant fish eating your subjects is probably a problem that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. Uh, so Quan is luckily a good leader in that sense. He builds a huge ship, uh, makes a burning human-shaped piece of metal, and then sails to the cave. Like an effigy? Yes. Wow. Like a like a burning metal fish hook, basically. Oh, some nice little burning metal bait. Yeah. So he lures the fish monster out of his cave with the human-shaped piece of metal because nothing says yummy like a burning metal human flesh. (laughs) That's what I always say. Uh, um, Taco Bell. No rules, just right. (laughs) Damn. (laughs) Sick burn on Taco Bell. Okay. Um, So the fish opens its mouth and tries to swallow the burning metal, but it burns its throat in the process. I just realized that no rules, just right is the Outback slogan of the Taco Bell. (laughs) It's sad that I didn't catch that either. Talk Shoot. about live moss, live which moss. like you're not going to be doing if you run into the fish monster. No, no. <laughs> but it's all no rules just right, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> Taco Bell's so loose with their like their rules yeah. that they can just steal other other companies' uh, slogans. I know, and Outback is like, just remember us, man. It doesn't matter what you call us. Oh, no, man. Just like, my grandparents gave me a really nice $50 gift card to Outback, and Jake <laughs> and I are going to go immediately. <laughs> Take me with you. I love their bread. Yeah, it's good. So Fish opens its mouth, tries to swallow the burning metal, burns its throat in the process. No! In its panic, it tries to sink Quan's ship, but the king takes his sword and slays the beast, cutting it into three pieces. Uh, okay. Superhuman strength. Yes, yes. I see. Is superhumanly long sword? Because it's, it's like cutting a watermelon, right? Like, just like gonna, slowly. It's going to like take you a while to get around that, that diameter. I just imagine it was like a butchering process. Okay. But I don't know. Fair. Maybe, maybe, maybe the giant fish monster's mouth was disproportionate to the rest of its body. Ooh, so it was yeah. actually a Little tiny body, body big but mouth. giant mouth. You like you, Julia. Thank Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> in in wit and spirit, like you, your wit is outsized to your body. Okay, I thought you were calling me a big mouth. Oh no, no, of course oh. I wouldn't. Mm-hmm. You're a good secret keeper and best friend. Yeah, thank you, buddy. I'm really good at keeping secrets. You are. I am. Except except when you tell me other people's secrets, which is delightful. <laughs> well, you like that, and you <laughs> also do. don't tell people usually. No, I don't. Who else would I tell? Just I don't you. Know. Yeah, that's that's true. Fish monster slain. Everyone happy, right? Yeah. Except, no, giant fish monster is not the only monster that is out there ruining the lives of the Vietnamese people. I was sure that you were going to say that the three parts uh, sprouted heads and became and like grew from baby fish monsters into bigger fish monsters. No hydro nonsense happening here. <sighs> okay. 
Bane. So Kwan wouldn't be much of a king if he just managed to serve up some monstrous goi kamai, which is a raw fish salad in Ooh. Vietnam that I looked up. Nice um, Vietnamese reference, girl. Thank you. Um, so after he kills the monster fish, uh, he goes to Long Bien, which is the home of a nine-tailed fox uh, that lived for over a thousand years known as Ho Tin. Volpix. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Because we're going to actually take a second to sidebar and talk about nine tailed foxes. In oh, general. please, yes. Okay. So, nine tailed foxes. Um, foxes? Fox? Foxes. Nine- foxes? Yeah. Okay. So, nine tailed foxes appear in a lot of Eastern Asian folklore, uh, though most of the stories tend to come out of China. Uh, nine tailed foxes can either be good or bad, depending on the story. Uh, normally, they were tricksters of some kind, very mischievous in nature, uh, and they would disguise themselves as beautiful women. Huh. Um, some stories would tell that in the form of women, they would seduce men and then consume their bodies or spirits. Dope. Cool, cool, cool. Um, but in this story, we can go ahead and assume that uh, Ho Tin is a malicious spirit. Okay. Um, living deep in a cave under a mountain, it would disguise itself in human form, lure women, bring them back to his cave, and then feed on them. So it was a male nine-tailed fox? Yes. Oh, were all the men bad and all the women good? Or it no. depended? Depends. Huh. No. The, the lady spirits would often, you know, eat the men, devour their souls or their bodies, so. Yeah, I feel like you don't have multiple genders in spirits a lot. It's always, like, the female banshee or, like, you know, the the male this and that or the, the I guess, selkies had both. But it's kind of cool to have a, like, fully fleshed out sort of, um, I don't know, like, sociological profile of a spirit race. You know, yeah, the things they like and places they live and, and different genders and families and stuff. It just, I don't know, makes it seem more like a, a shadow, you know, species living a amongst us than just like, oh, that's, you know, a Hydra. Yeah, I, I think that it's it's good in the sense that it's not uh, gendering and then making one gender seem evil or what have you, Yes, which tends to happen a lot in mythology, as we've discussed in the past. It's equal opportunity. Same. Yes, it is. Um, so Hotin, luring women, bringing it back to its cave and then feeding on them. Uh, The folks of the village nearby were actually so afraid of the fox that they abandoned their homes and farms to go to more peaceful places. Wow. So you got ghost towns happening. This fox is feeding on everyone. It's really bad. It's really evocative image. People going missing. Yeah, like that's that's quite a thing to be reckoned with. It feels very much like Stephen King's It. Yeah. Where it's just like no one talks about how all the children keep going missing for some reason. But yeah. Uh, everyone just kind of ignores it. And but again, in the situation, they actually leave. And the kind of calamitous or tragic or like not understandable event that leads us to seek meaning in mythology mm-hmm. and in lore. Yeah. Um, to, Might have uh, been a sickness or something at the time. Yeah. Or, or like abductions that. or yeah. suicide or like, you know, who knows what was happening? Just regular like walking off kind of abandonment, which I'm sure if you lived in a small village and needed to get the hell out, you know, that could sometimes happen. Um, so I'm really curious what happens with this folklore. Oh, uh, well, Quan hears about it, obviously, because he's the king. He hears about all the troubles in his kingdom. Good. He's a very good king. Like, I got to give him credit. He's a very good king. I was just going to say, I've been watching The Crown on Netflix, which I'm not usually like a kind of royal, I don't know, uh, you know, watcher or like person who enjoys Victorian Mm -hmm. or uh, British monarchical stuff. But this series is just delightful. There's a lot of like symmetrical settees and like well-polished silverware and like very beautiful, like mirrored hallways. It's just like very soothing to watch. And there's a lot of people um, governing, uh, not governing, because I don't know, at one point, Winston Churchill's like, there's a fog killing thousands of people a day in London because of cold pollution. It's fine. And and Elizabeth <laughs> is like, oh, yeah, the H bomb sounds bad. What's that? And and but only because she, she wasn't educated. Uh-huh. Anyway, it's fine. It's very complicated. Uh, but there's a lot of people just kind of being more interested in, in governing the impression of the royal family among the public than actually governing the public, which arguably isn't the British monarch's job. I'm getting confused. Anyway. <laughs> That just, that explanation stressed me the fuck out. Yeah, yeah. That happens over the course of a whole season, though, like all those plot points. And okay. otherwise, it's a lot of like horseback riding and, uh, and, and like eating breakfast on breakfast tables and breakfast rooms from breakfast trays from your Naturally. breakfast rooms. Naturally. Naturally, yeah. that would all happen. Okay. So Quan's doing a better job oh, than good. the folks in the, in the crown. Uh, so he takes his sword and he goes to Long Bien. Um, and he, 
you know, Sword's already killed one monster. He figures I can go ahead and kill this other one. Sure. Um, it's, so, not even, it's not even big enough to eat ten men in a boat. Exactly. It's fine. Um, so he goes to the cave, but the fox smells him before he can even enter the cave. Oh, no. Uh, but the fox thinks he's just some typical human, and so he attacks him. What does the fox think? That what, Quan what is a normal think? human being that he can oh, good. kill. Oh, good. Um, so Quan uses magic to call the elements of the wind and thunder to trap the beast. Ooh. Basically, Avatar Last Bender-like style. Oh, yeah. It's wonderful. Um, so they're in this like weird stalemate for three days with Quan manipulating the elements while the fox tries to break free. It's like a really intense struggle. Wow. Um, with like a lot of focus and, you know, like just wearing each other down. Uh, finally, the fox was weakened and tried to run away, but Quan quickly caught it and chopped its head off. Hey! Uh, Quan then managed to get into the cave and rescue those who were still alive and being tortured by the fox. Oh, uh, A, that sucks. B, uh, yay, I'm glad they're alive. Yeah, they're doing okay. It's all good. I just like the idea of, like, Avatar the Last Airbendering, like, for three days. Some crazy giant fox creature. Yeah, and, like, it, it makes sense, too, that you would need kind of um, help from the, from the supernatural or the elemental if you know, your human strength and even superhuman strength isn't enough to deal with a creature that is, you know, somehow uh, also magically supplemented. Like, mm -hmm. you kind of need like to fight with like. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it, you know, kind of emphasizes that idea that this lineage is, you know, imbued with dragon blood or descended from something divine or at least otherworldly. Um, if they're able to kind of channel, you know, those forces that the rest of us human beings and subjects are subjected to. I agree. I think also the elements tend to play a lot into the role of just like, Eastern uh, mythology kings, they yes. tend to be able to like tap into that elemental spirit, which I kind of dig as a, as just like a concept, um, like the human, the human king god thing where exactly. they can, they have more power because of their lineage into that yeah it seems like, like the divine and the natural worlds are more closely married mm -hmm. um in some traditions from east asia than they are in the ones that we grew up in where it was sort of like you know this is the the kingdom in which human beings live but we're not like necessarily uh you know tied to the earth which is why we're so bad at keeping care of it yeah that's true we're really bad at that it wouldn't be a good story if there wasn't a hint of romance, right? Hell yeah. And I want to tell you a little bit about that. But first, uh, I need a refill. Okay, let's do it. So, Amanda, I want to talk to you this week about RX Bar. Yay! <laughs> Adorable. Uh, so, RX Bar is a whole food protein bar. Now, Amanda, growing up, my dad was a bit of a health freak. He was. He had lots of exercise equipment in your basement. Yes. And he had a lot of like protein powders and protein bars and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and it was always encouraging me to try them. Uh, he used to make like, instead of regular brownies, he would make protein bar brownies. Oh, dad. They were the worst. So they cute. Were not really good. But like my point being, I never liked protein bars growing up. I would not eat them because they were gross and nasty and they always tasted really synthetic to me. Word. Um, RX bar is not like that at all. They're actually super delicious. And that is because RX bar's core ingredients do all the talking for them it's simply like eating three egg whites two dates and six almonds yeah like on the packaging which is really beautifully designed they just have the list of things that are in it and it's like five things it's yeah. awesome it's it's no bullshit when it comes to their ingredients uh and it turns out that real food ingredients actually taste really good yeah uh, like when i was vegan i would always eat cacao like that was the you know version of chocolate i was able to eat in mm -hmm. smoothies or in you know acai bowls or whatever and normally if there's like cacao in something you're just like okay it's vaguely chocolatey whatever but like this tastes like cacao it's yeah. awesome so like they'll have ingredients like cacao or actual real fruit or spices that aren't cut with weird uh ingredients yeah and i love especially that they use egg white to kind of be their binder mm -hmm. um i again when i was in college and kind of like exercising really heavily it was hard to find protein additives that you can actually digest like a lot of protein powders are just hard in the digestive yeah. system and they can like stop things up and it's just not a good situation mm -hmm. but egg whites are really easy for your body to absorb yeah and for those with uh, food intolerances they're also gluten-free soy free and dairy free normally all those frees mean it tastes bad but this one does not no and the best part is they don't add any sugar to it it's all natural sweeteners and stuff like that so that real fruit that you're tasting that's all that's in it ain't no sugar in there yeah, I really enjoyed the uh, peanut and chocolate 
uh, version. It was a really good like thing to have in the afternoon. I was going to be recording later, so I wouldn't have time to eat before recording, but it really tided me over. And it tasted like peanut butter and chocolate, which is exactly what I wanted to eat. But nice. without being so like gross and sweet that made me feel bad for eating it. You know, listen, it has a little bit of sugar in it. It's going to. Um, but if you're you know aware of what you're eating and that's kind of a thing that you're eating mindfully instead of like a snack that you think of as having zero calories in it, um, it can be a really, really good part of your day. Yeah, and I, I would grab these on the go before I got to work for breakfast because let's be real I don't have time for breakfast in the morning and then I just get really hangry by you know 11 o'clock and no one wants that especially when you're dealing with customers no one wants to deal with a hangry hangry person unlike the barista today who said literally no words to me during my entire coffee order nice. I walked in she like looked at me silently I ordered my coffee she made it held out her hand for the credit card I gave it to her and then we all walked away and I, mean, I was like wow fair enough thank you uh, but if you guys want to try RX Bar, you can go to rxbar.com slash spirits. And when you're checking out, enter the promo code spirits for 25% off your first order. Yeah, maybe you should order the chocolate coconut one, which is my favorite. Yum. That's again, rxbar.com slash spirits. And thanks very much to RX Bar for sponsoring us this week. Thank you. Now let's get back to the story. As we discussed earlier, Quan's relative was the founding father of Vietnam. Yeah. Well... You're about to meet the cultural mother of Vietnam. <gasps> Yay! Uh, and that is Alco. According to some stories, uh, is included in the Vietnamese creation myth of where the modern Vietnamese people came from, Alco. And she is known as a immortal mountain fairy. Wow, I want to be her friend. I know, it's not such a cool concept. Also, I just like the idea of like... Whatever she was probably didn't translate well, so we use the word right. fairy. Right. Um, so she's obviously, she's not like, you know, a fairy godmother or anything like that, but she's probably, I, I imagine she's probably closer to a nymph. Yeah, and, and even in British traditions, uh, the word fairy can mean so much. Like British and Celtic and Norse, like all of these different traditions have such different ideas of what spirits or fae or fairies or nymphs mm -hmm. or sprites could be. Um, but yeah, I, I imagine it's not the like Tinkerbell kind of fairy. Right, no, I think she probably falls more into the like traditional forest spirit, mountain spirit, um, yeah. but slightly more benevolent than the uh, the English fae would be. Right, so like kind of as I, what I think of as like tree sprites mm -hmm. or or like woodland nymphs yes. something along those lines yes um and you'll see she's a very benevolent uh character love it she was considered very beautiful and lived high in the mountains uh she was always isolated uh but that was kind of something she preferred cool. she preferred to like kind of live by her own rules and like visit people when she wanted to visit people but enjoyed being alone instead i'm just like hard same alco power hard to you same power to you so she was a very sympathetic creature as i mentioned before um she would travel down from her mountain to heal those who suffered from illness uh, because she was a well-known and skillful healer dope yeah so she like not even like using magic in order to heal people like legitimately all the stories that i saw like make very obvious references to her being able to do medicine like herbs solves like actual exactly medicine. like actual physical medicine and wow. not just like click your like touch your hands to someone and they're healed yeah. like that kind of thing that's amazing because yeah. like I, I have always been really drawn to alchemy mm -hmm. i think because it's a mix of like magic and chemistry um and it's it's a really like tangible way to use magic and to i don't know just really be amazed at the at the like hard process of getting a miracle done. Yeah. And I love here that the idea of like a, a divine healing or, you know, tied to nature kind of like power uh, also refracts or reflects itself through like actual hands on a body, you know, like using herbs and salves and, you know, whatever blood pressure type things to, yeah. to make people well. No, I like that a lot. Um, I actually, I think alchemy, I just like, I want to go off track for a second. Let's do it. I super love alchemy. I yeah. think it's just like, a fascinating concept of like magical science or yeah. like science magic like one of those things where it's just like it's such a good precursor to what we understand now to be science yes and i like this idea that like science is just like magic that we understand now yes you know what i mean yes like we can create gold we like understand that like gold is one thing and like whatever is another but we can like create things if we like put the right molecules together yeah or like you can make shit levitate with magnets right like you can make things change color or smoke with uh you know different chemical reactions and 
it's just, uh, it's so amazing to me. Like that's why we talk all the time about how mythology is an explanation oftentimes for stuff we don't quite understand Mm -hmm. or things that we like know the general shape of them, but the details are hazy. Um, and like, I, I love studying, like, I wasn't like a magic kid, but I, I like the occasional, you know, documentary about people who do illusions in the present day. Cause it's just so cool to look at something and be like, I don't know how the F that is possible, but actually it's a person doing it. Or I don't know how it's possible for scientists to know what antibiotics are going to solve like the illness in my body. Like mm-hmm. it's fucking amazing. It's so cool. And I don't know, as theater kids, both of us, you know, I think your parents and my parents also asked us like, you know, studying theater and knowing how stuff is done behind the scenes, doesn't that like diminish your enjoyment of seeing stuff? And we're both like, no, man, like it makes it so much better. You appreciate the craft so much more. Yeah. You know, not just that this is like a beautiful spectacle happening in front of you, but all of the like human lives and sweat and blood and tears that are going into making this thing possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know, that's why I, I love chemistry a lot. I love medicine a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really dig these kinds of traditions to tie it back to the myth of, you know, it's not just that you are using your sword and your strength and your, you know, rule to make people's lives better, but like you're going out there, like summoning, you know, the will and spirits and and whatever kind of divineness you have within you to conquer monsters. Yeah. And I want to kind of go back to just the idea of magic being science we understand. Yeah. Uh, and I want to talk, I want to make a recommendation Ooh. and that would be Sawbones, which yes. I know you listen to, but I, do. I don't know if all of our listeners listen to. Yes. Uh, and Sawbones is a marital tour to misguided medicine. Marital- I think tour through misguided medicine yeah uh and it's very it's wonderful um but it's basically all about how we didn't really understand how medicine works and we got a lot of it right through just trial and error yes so dr sydney mcelroy and her husband justin uh have this podcast where they talk about medical history which sydney is really um really into and they take us through yeah what was right what was wrong all the ways in which like we figured it out somehow through just you know, accident or intuition, um, and the ways in which we were really, really wrong. Like they love, they love to just quote Pliny the Elder, who's like, I don't know, throw an herb on it (laughs) or, you know, drill a hole in your head. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Just like, just bleed it, just bleed it. You're bleeding too much, bleed it. And, and anyway, it's, it's a amazing that humans ever got to the level of medicine that we have now where we can actually like save and extend life in meaningful ways. Um, but also, I don't know, it's just, it's so amazing. But my, my favorite stories are the ones where it's just like, yeah, like someone figured out like, charcoal's okay it doesn't solve all your problems yeah, but like yeah. sometimes it's good or like aspirin man does a lot of things reduces heart attacks i don't know keep taking it honey like strangely antibiotic for some reason yeah Who the fuck knew yeah i don't know if you like plaster a wound and i don't know not let it be exposed to the germy germy air then it might end up being better. Sometimes humans are just wonderful and we just figure stuff out and it's or great. Or the one guy who was like, you know what, guys? Hold on. I think I should wash my hands before operating on a body. Yo, crazy. Come on, man. Like, oh, so good. Okay, my point of this being... Oh, yes, the mountain sprite. Alco figured out a lot of this stuff because she was an excellent healer and like actually knew how to do medicine. And introverted, to lived her life. Power to you, just lady. Just so good. Um, so one day, Alco is down in a village helping some sick folks and is making her way back home after she healed them. Cool. Um, but as she does so, a monster appears and frightens her. You know, typical. Girl in the woods. Yeah. Uh, so being a cool fairy lady, she turns herself into a crane and flies away. Nice. Uh, Quan is in the area at the time, uh, and he grabs a rock and kills the monster for her. Oh, I thought you were going to say he grabbed a rock to throw at her, and I was like, no, 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 no. he's been so good. Uh, Alko stops to see who has helped her, uh, turns back into a fairy, and they fall in love instantly. Oh, it's Julia. very cute. Um, so they get married. Aw. Uh, and Alko bears him an egg sack because fairy i guess that sentence did not go the way i thought it was gonna go (laughs) um and from that egg sack hatches a hundred children oh my god now these a hundred children are very important because they collectively become known as the bakviet okay these children would become the ancestors of the modern vietnamese people uh hence alco being known as the mother of vietnamese civilization i love it and i love that it's two people who like have dope lives and then fall in love i know because there are so many stories where it's like something is missing or you're you know you need saving or often women like their lives are are just lacking in some way Mm -hmm. uh and then like love solves all the problems but here they're like we both have pretty good shit going on we're good the the you know he slays monsters knows what he's doing Mm -hmm. good ruler travels the land and she's like yeah got my whole setup got my house got my vocation get to travel back and forth see people when i want to see them Mm -hmm. life is great but then life gets better because you're in love yes that's true 
Um, so interestingly, supposedly there's something called the hundred Vietnamese family names in that there are only oh. about a hundred surnames one can have in Vietnam. Sure. But these names are all supposedly from the hundred children that are born in this story. That is really cool. It's super, super cool. I'm going to link something about the hundred Vietnamese family names in the show notes. Uh, because it's like a really fascinating thing and like the breakdown of like how many people have certain surnames in the country is like a thing like that people study. That's amazing. It's really, really cool. Um, So, however, these kind of stories don't always have happy endings. Oh, no. But this one isn't like terrible, okay? Okay. It's not bad. I'm going to take my drink. It's actually super amicable. Uh, despite their love for each other, Aoko desired to return to her mountain again. Oh my god, hard sing. And Kwan wanted to return to the sea where he lived. Okay. Um, Wait, in or at the sea? At. He okay. lived at the sea. He's <laughs> not in say, the sea. There's an underwater palace here you've been holding no, from me. I, I would now. tell you immediately <laughs> if there's an underwater palace. You know me. Thank you. Um, so Kwan's actually super chill about it. Okay. He tells her, I am descended from dragons, you from fairies. We are as incompatible as water is with fire. So we cannot continue in harmony. Wow. Yeah. I I so love that idea that you can like spend time with someone, have a really great experience, right? Like spend several great years or get something good out of it, whatever it is, and part ways. And like, that is okay. It doesn't, you know, invalidate what came before. It doesn't mean that you, anyone was a bad person. Like sometimes the, the you know, causes are just what they are yeah. and you can, you know, be adults about it and, and be kind and compassionate and, you know, move along. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think amicable like endings to relationships are tend to be kind of rare in, uh, modern day especially in stories right because it's the it's like it's the fiery ones it's the like huge magnetic romances that are like destructive or amazing or star cross tear everyone else apart exactly or like the breakups that end with like several people dead or or whatever it is you know (laughs) Romeo and Juliet we're looking at you it's serious I was thinking the same thing Mm -hmm. like oh my god good lord people come on get it together Oh, just never throw balls fucking teens that's the that's the point of don't invite teens to balls yeah that's the end of the slash don't have family feuds just never just Just don't don't. do it don't let it be intergenerational don't hold your take care of your shit take to the grave with you come on bullshit is what we're saying (sighs) we're just like super bad about Romeo and Juliet right now if I never see another adaptation it'll be too soon I would be like totally fine with never seeing a production of that ever again or you know what I know this is this is uh we're talking about Woodland Fae here I've seen a lot of Midsummer Night's Dream don't We've seen a lot anymore. of it. I just don't. Like, there's some good stuff in there. We're a little yeah. hell on Hermia. We got a little bit of that going on. Yeah. But, like, there's just a lot in there. There's a lot of songs, a lot of tinkerers, a lot, a lot of play of, like, within a play. Bad jokes. Just I know. unnecessary jokes. The, I've seen the donkey thing done well once. The Pyramus and Thisbe thing is always bad, though. I know. Like, Except for when my brother played the wall in high school. That was and as adorable. the tallest person in his class, it was fucking adorable. Yes. Well done, Connor. But, like, usually it's terrible. This has been Shakespeare Criticism with Amanda and Julia. <laughs> I feel like we could spend another 10 minutes doing that. We haven't even gone into stuff we liked. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, man. Make that production of Hamlet, though. <gasps> oh, okay. So, so good. context for our listeners. Yes. Amanda and I saw a production of Hamlet. It starred Oscar Isaac and Keegan-Michael Key oh, like a couple months Lord. ago. So good. It was four and a half hours of wonderfulness. Two intermissions. Two four and a half hours. Really hot day. We were both fucking there for it. We were so sad when it ended. good. I wasn't even like tired by the end of it. No. I was just kind of like zoned. I was yes. in the zone. It was so good. It was so spare. Like Keegan-Michael Key brought a humor to the role of Horatio that, that I have never seen in my entire life and it wasn't like you get a comic on stage you have to either be like this is a comic okay we know who it is or be like everything's terrible and like totally dismiss the this baggage that the audience brings in mm-hmm. but he was both he was great at his was role i never wanted him to stop talking oscar isaac was such a moody teen he was also in his underwear like 90 percent of the time and it was so I good know. he got his wet booty. and in dirt that booty mm. Exactly, you know. uh, Polonius was super good in that production. Polonius too. was fucking Amazing. hilarious. Everyone's like uncle from the Upper West Side. I'm always so bored with the character Polonius, and like I but actually so looked good. forward to scenes that I he was, was doing. Sad when he died. Yeah. 
Goodbye. I mean, like, I'm pretty sure that's what Shakespeare wanted me to feel when Polonius died. It's so rare that you get an actually, um, I don't know, like compelling and human uh, interstitial character like that. Like whether it's the porter in Macbeth just doing like, lol, people just die, but it's fine. <laughs> Knocking everyone's drunk. There's a fart joke. Goodbye. <laughs> you know, like those, those kinds of scenes have a real purpose, but it's hard in this day and age when we care more about like the motivations of characters than we do their like archetypes um, to get something really relatable out of it. But they really managed to, man. Uh, shout out to our friend Zach Labresco from Wolf 359 who did an excellent production of Macbeth where he played just a shit ton of roles and it was amazing. Including the porter, Including right? Including the porter, yeah. which was my favorite porter scene I've ever seen. And I saw a production that had, uh, what's his face in it? Patrick Stewart. Yep. And damn. We did. Damn. That production was better. And uh, if you're in New York, go to the public theater, see whatever is there. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a good one. It's always good. Uh, back to the story. Let's finish it up and then we'll talk about more Shakespeare. Yay. They break up. Amical okay. breakup. All right. Like solid divorce. Um, like any good divorce, they uh, split assets. Mm-hmm. And the assets in this case are their children. Okay. So they 50, each 50. get 50 children. Nice. Uh, Quan goes back to the sea in the south, to his kingdom there, um, while his uh, ex-wife returned to the mountains of the north uh, with half of their children. Nice. Uh, Alco's children, like the ones that she raised, um, were said to have all been young, intelligent, and strong leaders uh, who would become known as the Hung Kings. Ah. In fact, the oldest son that followed his mother actually became Quan's successor and ruled as the next Hung King. That's kind of cool, though, that he grew up with his mom and then ended up taking over his dad's yeah, job. Yeah, I, I like it a lot. I feel bad for, like, the eldest son that, like, Quan had. Yeah. But, uh, like, it, it's made very clear that Aoko's side of the family were, like, the strong, intelligent leaders because they were raised by a strong, independent woman. Hey, um, hot take. Hot take, hot take. Um, and so he became the next, like, leader of that dynasty. Cool. And it was really, really cool. And that is the story of Lak Long Kwang wow. and Ao Ko. I dig it so much. I just, I love that there's this, again, like we were saying at the very top, you know, 5,000 years ago, human beings were still being human beings. And to have people who, you know, have their own lives meet later in, you know, later in life compared to like the 15 year old romance, you know, that, mm-hmm. that people in Romeo and Juliet had, um, and had some good times, decided to split and then just managed to like co-parent and, uh, you know, live their lives and like have a, have a dynasty and a legacy. I don't know. I love it so much. Also like just a, a, like a great example of how one can have a successful life and like a successful relationship even after the romantic aspect of your relationship is finished. You can have it all, you Julia. Can. It's amazing. <laughs> it doesn't have to be angry and bitter, everyone. It's all good. You can live your truth and your life and it's excellent. You can. You can do it partnered. You can do it not partnered. You can partner with various people and genders and ages and occupations and places in your life. Like life is a long, rich tapestry if we're lucky and and, you know, you get lots of opportunities to be with lots of different people and to be lots of different people in mm-hmm. that time. Yeah. Um, I think if we learn anything from Alco and Lak Long Kwan, it's to just kind of like live your truth. Yeah. And like, even if it doesn't lead down the path that you think it's going to lead, right. um, it, you can still have a successful and fulfilled life. Yeah. And like real talk, one of the things that I'm thinking about in 2018 um, is all the ways in which uh, like self definition is malleable. Mm-hmm. Like your idea of yourself is ever changing. It's dynamic and it should be. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of get caught up thinking about myself as like the kind of person that does this or like when we were growing up, I was like, you know, the bookworm or the mom or the stage manager or like whatever it is. And uh, when you are less sure of yourself, uh, whether that means that you're younger or you just don't know what your identity is quite yet, it is so nice to find a box that kind of fits you mm-hmm. and to be like, oh yes, like finally, this is me. This is a shortcut. People can understand what I'm about. If I tell them like, oh, I'm a stage manager, every single person who is an SM or knows what that is, is just like, oh, I get you now. Mm-hmm. And like that gets you 80% of the way there. Um, but I don't know, just like in my in my mid twenties so far, like I have changed so much. Like things that used to be important to me aren't anymore and things that I never thought I'd be interested in, I am. Um, the emotional support that I need from people in my life is so much greater than I thought that I would need as a teenager who's like, stop, I don't need anyone. I'm fine. And thinking that Alco could be like, this is my life now, like mountain set up. I know what I'm doing. I visit villages. I heal people like life is good, or at least life is something that I can accept and, and feel okay about. Um, and then, you know, meeting someone completely shakes it up. And then that isn't what she ended up doing either. Mm-hmm. Like you, you know, you can move past it and, Everything else is still valuable, even if it ends up ending. Yeah, I like that. And 
I, I'm not sure how much this pertains to the story, but um, you mentioned like kind of putting yourself in boxes that yeah. define you. Yeah. Um, and I think as as I've grown older and as I've kind of been adapting more to like what my own self identification is, yeah. Um, I think I'm. It's it's better to have a a Julia shaped box that I put stuff into that define me, yeah. Rather than boxes that I put myself into that define me. Wow, that's really profound. Oh, yeah. thank you. I like that a lot. Instead of just like cutting off little bits of yourself that you deposit into the, you know, uh, occupation box or the hobbies box or the romantic partner box. Put stuff or the sibling. into you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I like that. Now, now I'm picturing like walking around like, you know, like a, a Lego, I almost said Lego palace, a Lego store, sure. which feels like a palace to I, me. I love a Lego palace. Or a Dylan's candy bar where you can like take a little bit out of each, mm -hmm. like a, like a, a choose your own yeah. or pick and mix as they call it in the UK. Like uh, yourself, you are a pick and mix. You yes. don't have to fit into any one of them. You can take little bits. You can put them back. You can hopefully not put them back. It's unsanitary. Never mind. You can discard <laughs> them or, you know, you, you can, you can refill yourself as time goes on. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. That's just, it's so freeing to think like, this is what I like now. And this is mm -hmm. right now what myself is composed of but like the the outline of myself will remain mm -hmm. even if the constituent parts change over time yeah i i like that a lot i think it's just so much better when people are like i don't put myself in a box man i'm like of course you don't because you are the box hey. you're the box that makes up like yourself and then all the things that you put in there define you it's not putting yourself into different boxes hot take no that's hot beautiful take, i love it i love, I love it, it. Oh, oh, well thank you jules for sharing this my pleasure amanda so listeners, remember that uh, that you you are the box. You are the box. You are the box. Maybe your box lives on a mountain and is like totally chill, just being very much introverted. Or maybe your box is out there slaying some uh, giant monsters. Maybe your box reaches a point in life where you're like, finally, this is me and I am so content and my life is fulfilled and then falls in love. Yeah. And then, then your box just gets a little bit bigger and has more space to put things. Oh, very sweet. Um, and while you figure that out, y'all, remember, stay creepy. Stay cool. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, and Instagram at Spirits Podcast. We also have all our episodes, collaborations, and guest appearances, plus merch on our website, spiritspodcast.com. Come on over to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Throw us as little as $1 and get access to audio extras, recipe cards, director's commentaries, and patron-only live streams. And hey, if you like the show, please share us with your friends. That is the best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.